And let me introduce our researcher and convener, Lola Lastenau. Lola is a PhD candidate in the sociology department at the University of Oregon. Her research focuses on precarity, low wage migrant workers, public policy and collective organizing. She has received several awards for her dissertation work and will be a Wayne Morse graduate fellow for the academic year, this coming academic year, 2021 to 2022. Her recent, congratulations on that, Lola. Her recent publications include No Choice But To Be Essential, Expanding Dimensions of Precarity During the COVID-19, and Impossible Choices, How Workers Manage Unpredictable Scheduling Practices. And Lola is going to give a presentation on her work, followed by a panelist of um, actual workers, so we can hear in their voices how this experience has affected them and what they hope to change. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers afterwards. Uh, please put any questions you have in the chat and I'll be collecting those. Or if you'd like to raise your hand during the Q&A period, um, go ahead and do that. If you are a, Espanol speaker, please look at the interpretation uh, icon in the bottom menu bar. Uh, and we have an interpreter this evening, Bryce Sprower, who will be uh, translating into Spanish. And that reminds me to maybe speak a little bit slower. <laughs> uh, and there will be a period where our Spanish speakers will be speaking about their experiences and Lola will be asking uh, questions of the panelists in Spanish. And at that time, English speakers should navigate to that icon and select English. So if you would like to hear in Spanish, navigate to Spanish. If you need to navigate to English, um, use that icon to do so. Lola is going to give her initial presentation in English, and then during the uh, panel portion, that will be primarily in Spanish. Okay, this is one of our first uh, uh, experiences with using this interpretation service through Zoom, and we're hoping to use this uh, for most of our coming presentations. And so excuse us while we navigate the process and, and learn how to do this the best way. Lola, take it away. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so before I start, I'm just going to quickly move to Spanish just for a second. Uh, para los que hablan español, hay interpretación disponible en caso de que no hayan entendido cuando Jen estaba diciendo. Eh, si va a apretar el icono, pone ir al canal de español y ahí pueden escuchar eh, la interpretación simultánea. So uh, for English speakers, I was just like quickly telling Spanish speakers about the interpretation um, that is available for this uh, meeting. I want to thank you all for being here. Um, and I want to especially thank the workers and organizers who are joining me and who are going to be sharing their experiences uh, later on. I'm going to hear from people from uh, workers from workers and activists and organizers from Trabajadores Unidos por la Justicia, um, organizers from UFCW 1439, and Friends of Tyson. So, all right. <laughs> so I'll just do a quick presentation of some of the findings of the report, and um, I'll let workers then share their experience because that's the most important part of all. Um, all right, so give me one second. Uh, okay, so, you know, the COVID-19 pan COVID pandemic revealed many glaring inequalities that underpin social, economic, and political orders across the United States. One example of this involves food processing workers. And while these workers are usually hidden uh, from the public's views and awareness, they play a critical role in the food supply chain. The workers of these forgotten factories, right, have long endured and safe working conditions, long and physically demanding work days, unpredictable schedules, low wages, and the highest accident rate in manufacturing. Last year, as workplace outbreaks led to spikes in the number of infected workers, responses by both employers and federal agencies were limited at best. 
Concerns about potential food scarcity, which never really materialized, were prioritized over the well-being and health of the workers, as plants continue to operate normally or even hike production. As today, over 1,400 meat packing and food processing plants have had confirmed cases of COVID-19. At least over 76,000 workers have tested positive for COVID-19, and over 340 food processing workers have died. Discourses about essential work do not necessarily translate into workers feeling like heroes, but actually quite the opposite, with many expressing that they felt sacrificial. Based primarily in 40 in-depth interviews with immigrant and refugee workers and labor and community organizers living and working in the Yakima, Benton, Franklin, and Walla Walla counties, the specific contribution of the report I'll be presenting is to highlight workers' experiences during the past year. Qualitative research is very needed in public policy because it allowed us to contextualize policies and have a micro lens to the impacts and challenges experienced by those directly affected by them. Importantly, it allows us to visualize the experience of populations that are most marginalized and more vulnerable, and that might not be taken into account by larger, larger studies, such as migrant workers, who make up over 30% of the workers in the industry and are the focus of this report. So today I'll be sharing their experiences, uh, thinking about three main dimensions. One, workplace conditions. Two, access to benefits and public assistance. And three, medium and longer term impacts of the pandemic in their lives. But before we dive in, <laughs> let me advance some of the main conclusions I arrived to uh, through this research and which can be seen in the quote by a food processing worker that is on the screen. The first is that a slow and unequal rollout of workplace safety policies, which were first only recommendations and guidances, meant increased employer discretion regarding workplace rules and significantly hurt food processing workers. The second is that the fragmented nature of the regulatory and benefit system decreased workers' ability to successfully access much needed relief, placing them between a rock and a hard place, having no option but to keep working even if they felt unsafe or they were sick. So let me explain a little bit of why this report focuses on Eastern Washington, especially the Yakima, Franklin, Benton, and Walla Walla counties. So as you can see in the maps, these counties had had a high concentration of COVID-19 outbreaks in food processing facilities. And both Yakima and Franklin actually have the highest share of COVID-19 cases by population in the whole state of Washington. Food processors are some of the largest employers in this region. While 1% of the US workforce is employed in food processing, 12% of the populations of Benton and Franklin counties are employed in this sector. And 40% of all manufacturing in Yakima is food processing. Importantly, what drove me to take a closer look to this area was the workers' own organizing action to protect themselves and their families and share what was going on more on which we'll hear in just a bit from the workers themselves. So just to give you a quick overview of the sample, um, you can see how a larger of my sample is women and workers with dependents. Um, I interview people in fruit packing, veggie processing and meat packing. I interview migrants with different statuses, you know, DACA recipients, people with permanent residency, um, undocumented workers, workers with refugee status. I spoke with workers in 14 different companies in the region, employed in different capacities, line workers, quality control, machine operators, forklifters, et cetera. And you can see you know, other things on the screen. Okay, so let me show you some of my main findings. Um, so to analyze workplace safety, I consider the CDC recommendations issued in April 2020 for food processing facilities and ask workers about them. I don't want to go into a lot of details since workers themselves will share with us what they face, but some elements are worth mentioning. First, there was an overall reluctance by employers to significantly alter the labor process to ensure physical distance mostly favoring the use of plexiglass or plastic dividers instead of finding other ways to ensure physical distance. 
This solution proved limiting as the dividers were installed without any oversight, broke often, and in some cases moved around as workers did their jobs, rendering the alleged separation between workers inexistent. Employers were slow to roll out policies, and many did not allow workers to wear masks until late April 2020. Others charge workers for their masks, and many only offer perhaps one mask a week. And keep in mind that many workers in this industry work six days a week. Moreover, many companies continued using presences and bonuses, um, some even as you know, their version of hazard pay, which encouraged workers to come in while sick. And this was you know, exactly the contrary of the CDC recommendation. Most companies did not have any policy to trace exposures or exclude asymptomatic workers. Importantly, I want to connect these conditions with established channels for workers to do something about workplace safety violations. So um, a public records request that I did shows an alarming number of complaints made against food processing companies by workers and a slow response by OSHA. For example, workers in one company first filed complaints in early May, and many more were filed in the following weeks until a partial inspection was conducted by OSHA in late June. However, you know, a worker had already died by then in early June, and many, many more had gotten sick. In another instance, workers started filing complaints in early April, citing that there was no protection, that they felt unsafe, that there was like a violation of workplace safety rules, um, and continued to file complaints um, over the, the next two months. There was even over 20 complaints against this company before a partial inspection was done in June. So by then, workers at the plant had been striking for weeks. And we know that despite the clear spiking claims, OSHA conducted 44 less inspections in 2020 than in the year before. However, government officials continue to insist that workers use these channels, even if they were clearly unable to provide a timely response needed in the midst of an emergency. The other dimension I want to discuss is access to benefits and relief. So here, the main element I want to highlight is that workers didn't know who to turn to find out about their workplace rights and the new state and federal regulations regarding, for example, pay leave. And oftentimes, human resource personnel at companies provided inaccurate or very limited information. While almost 73% of the workers I spoke to contracted the virus, most had not been paid for the time of work by the time I interviewed them, and some were still waiting, or had only received partial payment. Advocates and organizers found themselves trying to navigate contradictory information, being referred repeatedly to different agencies or entities, which then resulted in workers having their claims delayed or denied. And workers could not afford to wait. So let me share the comments of a refugee working at a meatpacking plant that shows the financial cost of providing the documentation they needed to stay home or access benefits. So the current hours, so this is quotes. So the coronavirus test was like $300, the doctor $200, $300 for lab work. I don't know what else they need. And the company's insurance is so expensive, so we don't have it. And it takes so much money. So even if you get any benefits, there will only be a hundred bucks left by the time we pay for everything we needed to get. So it's a waste of time. So what are you gonna do? Go to work, even though you're sick. And importantly, and this is my, you know, my last, the last dimension that I want to highlight, there was little, and, and it relates to, to the quote we just heard, there was little attention to the longer term impacts of the pandemic. So workers shared that they were pressured by employers to go back to work, even if they continue to be symptomatic. Companies rely usually on the two week average for recovery and fail to understand that this was not the case for many workers who were ill for four, six, eight weeks. And companies continued to demand that workers went back quickly. They also failed to provide light duty and expected many workers to work in the same way as before getting sick. Many workers were unable to take time off to care for their close relatives or dependents who were ill due to limitations and exclusions of the family extended leave policies or denials by the company that while unlawful, they did not know 
that they that they were so right so and there has been little to no provisions for the longer term impacts on workers well-being which is something that i found again and again while i was talking to workers workers were not able to access affordable mental health services in a context in which their co-workers and family members were getting sick and sometimes dying at outstanding rates So to conclude in my part, and before we move to hearing more details on this from the workers and organizers themselves, I want to flag some important issues as we have this conversation more than a year after the pandemic started and think about what lies ahead. First, the conditions I describe mobilize many of the workers to fight for workplace representation. And we must hear their stories because they also show the challenge they face when trying to exercise this very important right. Facing, as we will see, a lot of union busting, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Second, workers are still recovering from the impacts of the pandemic. As I just mentioned, many of them find it very hard to continue doing the jobs they had before they got sick. And there is no aid for them. For others, the financial impacts have meant getting behind with rent, bills, and many cases accrue debt. And we don't currently don't have any, we're not offering any financially viable options for low wage workers to recuperate from the physical and mental health impacts of being part of the largest COVID outbreaks. Finally, as we know, this is not over. Workers are still getting sick and now finding that the limited increased regulations that have, have been phased out a lot of workers have already used all their PTO, but are sick again. All their dependents are sick and they don't really know what to do. Um, this also has impacts for the vaccination campaign. Um, currently, workers can use their you know, pay time off to get vaccinated or stay home if they get feel sick after getting the shot. But many don't have any pay time off left. Um, a lot of them, for what I've seen are unsure of, about using it for this purpose because they don't know if they might need it in the future um and a lot of them can really cannot afford to lose any hours cannot really afford to that financially so i already advanced two of my main conclusions so here is the final and most important one I do not think it is a coincidence that what we that we saw this type of crisis in this industry I think we need to relate what has happened during the pandemic to the working conditions that have historically been part of food processing. And the forced disposability of the migrant and BIPOC workers comprise a large part of the workforce. You know, as the quote from the beginning said, COVID-19 fue la gota que derramó el vaso, was the straw that broke the camel's back. So future policy must not only deal with the outcomes of the pandemic, but we must face the serious limitations of a system that regulates labor, that it's antiquated and underfunded and continuously reproduces structural racism. So that's it for me. And as you can tell, I left out a lot of um, the most rich aspects of my, of my report, which are the quotes since we have the workers themselves are going to be doing some of that, of, uh, of sharing some of that. Um, so let me um, let me stop sharing my screen if I manage to do that. Well, actually, here's the. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to quickly show you what. So what we're going to do now is basically I'm going to introduce you to the uh, panelists. And, um, and I'm going to be asking them three questions. I'm just going to click quickly show you which the three questions are going to be and they're going to respond um, them. You know, we're going to go question one, question two, question three, basically. Um, and after that, we'll open for questions from the audience. So Mola, can I interrupt you for just a moment? I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, I just want to check in with um, anyone who's using the Spanish channel and just make sure that that's functioning as yes. we hope. I can I can ask in Spanish. Para okay. los que en español están pudiendo usar el canal en español, está funcionando bien, pueden hacer como un thumbs up. Oh, Maribel, ¿está funcionando? No, no se escucha. ¿No se escucha? No está funcionando, no me está funcionando. 
Ok, um, estás, um, Bryce, ¿estás en el canal de español o en el inglés? Sorry, eh, everyone. Se supone que estoy en el canal de español, pero no se escucha. Te estoy escuchando a ti en inglés. Um, so maybe Bryce will check if she can, um, if she's in the Spanish channel or she's in the English channel. Y si probas en el, y, Maribel, si probas en el canal de inglés. I'm hearing it now. I'm hearing her through the Spanish channel now. So okay, Maribel, ¿puedes escucharla ahora? I think we're good. A ver, Bryce, ¿puedes hablar? People are saying yes now. Yes, good. Yeah. Okay, sorry everyone, just having some interpretation issues, which we're we... learning, we're learning. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, okay well, <laughs> um, oh, all right. Um, so, yeah, so going back to the questions. So, the first one's going to be about working conditions. So, if you didn't hear my presentation, do not worry because the workers will share a lot of the things I already shared with you. Um, and the second one is going to be about what they did about them. Um, and what were the employer's responses? And the third one has to do with what's happening now and what are some of the lessons they've learned in their experience. So now, yes, let me stop sharing my screen. And let um, me remind you, Lola, um, to maybe speak in a, uh, a tempo that Bryce can translate easier, maybe. Okay, well, I'm having a hard time not sharing my screen anymore, to be honest. Speaking of technological issues. I can, I can stop your screen share if you'd like. Yes, perfect. All right, so let me introduce you to some of the people who will be um, chatting, sharing their experience. Um, so, as you know, we're going to have some workers from Trabajadores Unidos de la Justicia, and I see Angie Lara there, and Maribel Medina, and I see Agustin, who is also the president of the union, um, and I see Armida as well. Um, so they're all going to be participating on this. Um, we have Angel Dinin, she is um, an organizer with Friends of Tyson. Hi, Angel, thank you for being here. Um, and I see Laura Fish, who is an organizer with UFCW 1439. Um, so yeah, so I don't know who wants to go first. And basically, you know, the first question and the idea is like that you share what was going on in your workplaces um, last year and maybe still today. And yeah, and like particularly what, what type of things were you facing regarding COVID-19? I guess I'll start. Um, when um, we, uh, when last year, when we decided to go on strike before all this, I, I think we already had a lot of uh, issues that we wanted resolved. Um, that we wanted to take care of and change in the company. Um, there's so many things that need to change, not, not just because of COVID, but because of the way people are treating people in there, uh, the, work, the, the way they work them, the way they exploit them. Uh, it's always been money over health. Um, they, don't, they don't take people's health in consideration. So when COVID came uh, through, uh, it just... Um, it was one of those things that, that made it shine a little more because we um, started hearing that somebody got sick and then somebody else got sick, but we would just hear rumors. We never knew who it was. We would just hear, oh, did you hear somebody in this area got sick? And did you hear somebody in this area got sick? Um, because a lot, of, uh, a lot of us didn't really believe this uh, COVID was real. To be honest, I, I didn't believe it was real. I, I said, until I get it, I'm gonna believe in it. Other than that, I'm still skeptical about it. And sure enough, on April 30th, I uh, got sick. I went from being uh, working on in production, uh, I was moved to um, repack department. And uh, when I left home, I, I wasn't feeling well. It was something that I can't explain the way I was feeling. I was feeling a little off. I got home and I 
thought nothing of it um, until the next day when it, it hit me. Um, I woke up with a bad fever and chills. So I couldn't breathe. Um, I, it was kind of like, it got me by surprise. Um, I right away called the company, let them know what was going on because I had had contact with some of my coworkers and a lot of them had high risk, um, um, you know, uh, factors like asthma, um, older people at home, children, babies, um, you name it, they had it. So I wanted to make sure that I was passing the word on so they could take precautions at home and protect themselves and their family if indeed this was COVID. So what I did, I called the company. I, I let my supervisor know. I let her know. I mentioned the names of the people I was around so they can inform them. I gave her permission to say who it was so they, they knew in case I forgot somebody that I was around and I didn't remember. Um, I wanted to protect as many people as I could. And um, sure enough, um, I, was off, uh, I was sick for three whole days. Uh, almost four days without being able to breathe well. Um, I believe it was on the 30th when I got sick. On the, on the first, I got it was onset. So it was on the first, the second, the third, the fourth. On the fourth, I was advised by um, the one of the supervisors at Allen Brothers to go get checked. So I did. Um, I paid 150 for my test uh, from my pocket. I got tested. Um, call the company, let them know that I had gotten tested and that the results would be in any time that, that same week. Um, that was on the 4th. On the 7th, I uh, received a call from Romina Medina, one of my coworkers, uh, who uh, called me and said, Angie, we're on st we, we came out on strike, come over and join us. I thought nothing of it, to be honest. Like I said, I had no not much information on how to uh, take care of COVID or what steps to follow. Um, at the lab where I went, they told me that after three days of not being sick, I was no longer uh, I, I was no longer a threat to anybody. So I went to I I, I went to uh, the strike. I let everybody know that I was that I had gotten tested for COVID. I stayed as much as away as I could from everybody. Um, use my uh, mouth cover, and um, but still uh, join them. Prior to this, the week of April, the last week of April, uh, Blanca Olivares has spoken to me about um, going out on strike because we needed um, they needed to to give us better. Um, I'm gonna say what well, uh, mouth 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 covers. Um, they needed to protect us more from COVID, uh, take it serious and take steps to keep us from getting sick and taking this um, disease or um, COVID home. Um, it was not only to protect ourselves, it was to protect uh, everybody at home as well. So um, when this happened, um, it was just wait, let me see what they say. I spoke to them and they, they said they were going to talk about it. They'll come back to me and say what they decided. And this is how they were back and forth. Sorry, Angie, I don't want to interrupt you, but uh -huh. you, I, I wanted to, uh, to share a lot about the organizing, but let's hear a little bit first from what was happening in the other plans, and then we'll dive into the organizing, if that's okay. okay. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, maybe Laurel can um, share a little bit of what was happening in Twin Cities. Sure. Um, yeah, we had, um, so I, I work with uh, United Food and Commercial Workers, and we had workers at Twin City Foods reach out to us at the beginning of the pandemic um, for, you know, so a lot of a lot of things sound very similar. Um, managers telling people that masks weren't, um, weren't authorized, you know, the workers weren't authorized to use masks. Um, just a lot of, like, no information, you know, is actually kind of the lack of information about whether there was COVID in the plant, what the company was going to do about it that sparked um, an early an, an early walkout. Um, and then I think as the, you know, as the pandemic went on, really the, um, the lack of um, or insufficient um, paid time off and just not understanding, like, you know, it was hard for me as a, like, I do this, <laughs> 
<laughs> I do this as a, as a job, right? I like research things all day long and I could not figure out whether people were supposed to be paid or what programs were available, um, you know, for them to be, for, for them to be paid if they had COVID. Um, you know, I finally like, um, you know, and just the, the regulations of the CARES Act and how many, you know, how many employees does this company have um, and different mandates from the government or from the governor um, it was, you know, just really complicated to, to figure out. Um, and it led, so, uh, you know, a lot of workers ended up, um, you know, they, you know, didn't have health insurance. So, um, you know, like Andrew said, paid money out of their own pockets for, for COVID tests. Um, or weren't able to afford, you know, to take 14, to get tested and then take 14 days off work. Um, so, you know, if they had a family member who was sick um, or thought they had been exposed or weren't feeling that well, you know, often had, you know, went to work anyways. Um, so, and it was all of, so I think, you know, some of those things sound very, very familiar, but it was um, a lot of those conditions that, that um, sparked workers to organize um, at the at the beginning of the pandemic. Thank you, Laurel. Um, and Angel, do you want to share a little bit about what you saw happening in France Tyson, particularly in the among the refugee community? Um, yeah, I would say similar stories to Angie and Laurel. And um, I personally don't work at the plant, but I am friends with and, and the people we're working with Friends of Tyson workers um, are friends with many of the refugee families um, that are working there. Um, and initially it was uh, oftentimes contacts from the high school age uh, children of, of the workers who were reaching out to us and asking us um, what they should, what advice they should be asking, telling their parents. Their parents were gonna be asking them, should, is it safe to go to work? Um, they knew people were getting sick, but nobody was telling them any information about what was happening and what they should be doing to, to protect themselves. Uh, they would be someone who was just gone. Um, one day they were there, the next day they would be gone. They didn't know if they were ill or some people were just refusing to go to work, um, but they weren't really sure if their job was gonna be protected if they chose to stay home. And so there was a lot of fear um, there, like end of March is when the outbreak started um, at the Tyson plant and it was interesting, I'm an educator. So I, the Friends of Tyson Workers was just really started because of what happened with, with the pandemic last year. So there wasn't anything with Friends of Tyson Workers prior to the pandemic. Um, and like Lola had said, it really just exacerbated some things um, that we knew were already in place, some groups that were working to help and support the families. We already knew that there were you know, challenges um, in navigating systems and, we see those things when we're when we're supporting families, but this just exacerbated everything. And so that group was formed because of that. Um, and as we, we moved along, you know, as a professional myself in the area, I could just see the disparity between what my friends were facing in Tyson at the plant comparatively to myself as an educator. Schools had shut down. I, you know, all my colleagues were working from home. There had been one case that I knew of any teachers getting sick at this point. Hanford was shut down. There weren't any cases, but things were just really on fire at Tyson and the plant just kept running and they weren't providing any information to the employees. And so the employees were, were asking and seeking out kind of advice. Um, some of the, some of the um, barriers for my friends were, you know, at that point you had to have a primary care physician to be able to get the test. So a lot of my friends, you know, don't have a primary care physician, right? You know, uh, ongoing. And so that was a barrier. Um, accessing the testing, of course, was a barrier. Um, the contact tracing was pretty much nil, um, <laughs> especially in the beginning. There was just not a lot of um, follow up either with the company, with their own employees, or even with our local health department. They were asking for volunteers from the community. I'm most, most of the friends I have that work out there are Karan or Burmese um, folks. And they were asking for volunteers from that community to work at the Department of Health to help with that, but they were also all struggling with the with the pandemic, with the COVID, and so it was really an extra layer of expectation on a community that was already taxed. So um, some of the folks that were involved with Friends of Tyson Workers were they really got active uh, from the get go. Um, 
providing masks. We had a couple that was involved and they really knew a lot of the families. They were delivering masks to the doors and leaving on people's doorsteps, providing, trying to provide really quick information in, in multiple languages. So we were trying to get that information out as quickly as we could, but the company certainly wasn't providing much for them at that time. Thank you for sharing. And I'm gonna, um, I don't wanna, Armida, I'm gonna switch to Spanish just for a second. Armida, no te quiero poner en, si quieres contar un poco vos y, y le puedo decir a la gente que se pase al otro canal si quieres hablar en español. Claro que sí. Um, If people want to ask the English channel, our, our media is going to share. She's a, a worker, um, an organizer now with Trabajadores Unidos de la Justicia, but she was employed in a different company than Angie. So if you want to switch to the English channel, she'll speak in Spanish. Okay, I'm now starting an English channel. Good afternoon, my name is Admira Rivera, and I was also working in one of these companies that went on strike in Yakima. And what I've been hearing from everyone for the same reasons, the lack of protection that we had at work, antibacterial masks, nothing. We didn't have six feet of distance. We were all really scared. And we all thought that the companies weren't doing anything for us because they weren't giving us any materials or information. And they didn't have anyone cleaning the spaces or disinfecting the areas that we were working. They didn't let us know anything about the people that were starting to disappear. This person, we didn't know so that we could take precautions for ourselves. We had no information, so it gave us a ton of fear. We were all really scared. And then later they didn't disinfect. They didn't, they didn't change any of their um, production spaces because the apples were really expensive at that time. And because it was a, the season for apples, it was clear, it made us feel like we didn't matter. It was just the money. But like us as humans, they weren't even giving us hazard pay. They didn't want to even speak about it. And for that, we decided to go on strike. Thank you, Armida, for sharing that. Um, If folks want to return to the main channel, now they can. Folks that were in the English channel, uh, since Bryce is probably going to go to the Spanish channel, I don't know if that worked or not. <laughs> um, okay, so now I want to invite us to move to the second question, which is particularly in organizing, and everyone has already said a little bit on that. But you know, I want to go back to Angie, and I know Austina, the president of Trabajadores Unidos, is also. Um, here, so if he also wants to share, or Maribel, if anyone wants to jump in, you can. Um, and maybe you want to tell us a little bit of like, you know, how you went out on strike, um, and what happened. What you know, what were you asked? What were your demands, and what was the employer's response? Angie, I, I think I would like Agustin to explain this one because he yeah. has a good, yeah he has a, a good story about it. Is he available? Um, ¿Querés contar sobre la experiencia de la huelga? No sé si lo querés hacer en inglés o en español. Uh, lo voy a hacer en español, ¿está bien? Yeah, so we should switch to the English channel again since Agustin is going to be speaking. Okay, now I'm in English channel. Hopefully everyone can hear me. For Agustin. Well, one of the reasons that we spoke with the company to reach an agreement to protect ourselves and our other um, companions, our, our common workers. The managers, we sent an, an email to try and um, figure out a, a plan before deciding if we'd go on strike. And they didn't respond to us. Second day passed, they didn't respond to us. Not even to say that they weren't gonna do anything. So since they didn't do anything, we were forced to make an, a decision under the extreme circumstances. We're not going to go on strike this week, but for the next week that comes, we're going to 
choose a day to all go out on strike together. First, it began as a, a, a pacifist um, labor march. Well, it always has been. We didn't want anything violent. For us, we had to we had to do everything really well organized with a lot of respect because we also didn't want to disrespect the owners. We just wanted to demonstrate that we were serious and responsible as workers and as the people that we are. So we made the decision. It was one, it was the 7th of May one Thursday that we decided to start on strike. So on that day, we had spoken with the managers of the company. But by that time, we didn't, weren't interested in speaking with the managers because it was the first people that we tried to reach an agreement with and they didn't respond. So we tried to contact someone else in the company, someone else who was contracted, but who didn't achieve anything. So we spent 23 days in strike. And after about approximately as a week of being at strike, on strike, we came to an agreement, not an agreement, but the company wanted to speak with us to break the strike. They wanted all of us to all go back into the factory so they would have the justification that we all broke the strike. But we had a committee, a representation committee for the whole strike. So we sent that committee to be able to resolve, to find a good agreement with the company. but they didn't offer more than a dollar when we asked for two for um, the sick pay or risk risk pay. They were only presenting a dollar, but we were demanding, because by that time we had already decided as a group to demand more, um, more protections for our labor. So we didn't want the, the pay to be the same for someone who's already been there for 20 years versus someone who just got there a day. It's our first day at work. And especially because during this time of the, well, not only because of the pandemic for being essential workers, but just for being workers as we always had working in this type of company. It shows that they really don't think we're essential. And that's what's sad about this really, that many of these companies just look for someone new to replace someone because they come in with um, with interest of, of working hard, making money versus someone who's been there for 20 years, working six days a week, who's really always been there. So when we had gone back to the company after reaching an agreement with the, with the company, we took some time to negotiate to be able to reach, um, to gain more benefits, that they would pay us more if we were working overtime and to achieve other changes like vacation days, rest days. Trying to improve these benefits, but those also didn't come through. So we made another decision to organize ourselves as an independent union. And that's what we focused on, trying to organize, organize ourselves as a union. And thanks to all of this, of the story that I'm telling you all, 
it was really important the support of the other organizations in order to really achieve all this. The attorneys, the independent union of families, the other organization of community, community, the consulary of of labor in Yakima, and and um, excuse me if I'm forgetting someone. There are so many, all of these have, have given us this ability to uh, arrive at this point, to be able to achieve all of this through this long fight with this company. So we decided to, to make this union inside the union. And of course they made it impossible for us to organize. They persecuted us inside they intimidated us, punished us for things. And, and even those who are just there to represent us, they suffered as well. They try to avoid that companies and, or excuse me, that organizations will uh, organize themselves together. They make it harder, right? Thank you for letting us share this with, with you all. Yes, Elkin, thank you. So now I'm gonna ask um, Laurel to share a little bit of what the organizing looks like in her city. Sure. Um, so I, I think, it, you know, Twin City Foods workers made a similar decision that the types of in the wrong channel. Um, so they made a um, they made a similar set of decisions um, to you know the, the types of changes that they wanted were um, you know were long term like had to do with the the short term crisis of the pandemic, but also the long term changes to have um, you know respect and an agreement with um, you know a, an agreement with the employer right to sit down face to face with the employer. Um, I think the, um, you know, the difference at Twin City Foods is the, um, the public pressure um, did really, um, you know, did make the company back off um, to, you know, in with their union busting tactics. Um, so there was, you know, the media and um, media and rallies um, and, you um, you know, other like other tactics that we used, um, you know, did make it so the company, you know, the company took a step back um, and, um, you know, I think, and workers were able to, to vote successfully to join, um, to join UFCW. Um, I think I would say it's still incredibly hard, like even, you know, even without like a, you know, hardcore anti-union campaign, um, it is still very, very difficult for workers to organize. You know, the company appealed at every step of the, every step of the process. Um, so it took, you know, months and months um, to actually get to an election and then have that election, um, you know, have those votes be counted, um, you know, because, because <laughs> labor law, because the system is, is set up to, um, you know, be, be rigged against workers. Um, so, you know, but I think we did, workers won, a, won an election for representation successfully and we're in the process of negotiating, um, you know, negotiating a first contract um, so that there's that long-term, um, you know, long-term changes to have, um, you know, for workers to have a say in the decisions that affect them at work, the money and the rights and respect. Yeah, and um, I want to share that I actually witnessed the Twin City election over Zoom um, since pandemic times, and it was it, they won overwhelmingly. Like there were only two votes against in the whole bargaining unit, which shows like you know the level in which like the, the workers really, really, really wanted representation, and I, you know like never seen something like that. It was just 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 unanimous basically, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, so Angel, um, do you want to share a little bit of like, okay, what, you know, what did Friends of Tyson do? You share already just a little bit of the first actions you all did, but like, you know, how did you get to the point of like getting Tyson to shut down, which you did? Um, well, we, 
formed up this, you know, the small group. I think there's probably half a dozen of us um, that formed up, but with the support and um, the direction of um, many of the workers themselves were involved in our some of our initial meetings. And again, some of their children and the spouses of uh, workers as well, uh, were pro they were providing um, some insight. We did develop a petition that seemed to be particularly helpful in um, kind of generating some publicity around the fact that the plant was continuing to run, um, even with um, the continuation of increasing cases. So the petition um, went out and I think it ended up several thousand vote, uh, several thousand signatures at the end. We did a, a, a really strong outreach to do some publicity um, with different journalists here locally, just to shine light um, here locally and then also like Seattle and some of the Spokane papers, Walla Walla. We had a particular problem with the fact that this particular plant is in Walla Walla County, but many of the, many of, or most of the workers live in Franklin County. And so uh, some of the, the challenge we faced was just the, the Department of Health in, in Walla Walla County not, and also the political um, <laughs> alignment of Walla Walla County not really wanting to um, put any pressure on Tyson to, to take the steps they needed to do to protect the workers. So that was particularly challenging. Um, we, we did reach out, um, I think it was uh, Senator Pat, uh, Patty Marie's um, office. It was probably the most responsive, quite honestly, to us. Um, and, and at that time, there were a lot of political things happening with um, the president was issuing those orders specifically for meat processing to increase production at that time and also to demand that the workers um, and that those plants stay open. So that was particularly challenging as well. Um, again, I think it was a lot of it was hearing from the from the workers themselves. Uh, we did have an once the plant did close for a pause and they did agree to test all the employees finally. <laughs> um, Hundreds of people tested positive. I don't um, at, at that point, and we did have um, a daughter of one of the workers who came in after that and, and started another petition around um, benefits and access to benefits and some of the things that the workers were dealing with in their personal lives and in, in trying to navigate the systems. And I don't know if we'll talk more about that later, but we we really struggled to help families get access to um, the benefits that were available to them um, and that they weren't familiar with. And I think Laurel mentioned earlier that just the navigation of those benefits was a nightmare and trying to give um, ac accurate advice to the, to the workers um, at that time. So yeah, I, I don't know if many of you know the history of, of Tyson Wallula, but they, they have had an interesting labor history. And so at this point, there's, there's still not a union in place there. Um, we did do a vigil at one point because three workers did lose their lives, Direct three direct workers in the plant um, passed away from COVID. And so we did do a vigil. Um, United Farm Workers was there for that vigil and helped kind of support that and organize that. So it was a really, it was a really ch challenging time. That was, that was April, May of last year, mostly. Thank you, Angel. Well, and now um, I want to move us to our last question. Um, and basically, the last question has to do a little bit of like, okay, like, you know, we're a year in. So what's happening now? Uh, what's happening at the workplaces? What's happening with the, you know, the, the organizing um, initiatives? And, you know, I guess, in a way, like, what are the th thoughts and future policy? And I know everyone has been doing different things. So I think it's really interesting to hear um, from all of you. So uh, once again, I would like to open the floor first for folks from Trabajadores Unidos por la Justicia. So I don't know who wants to take um, this one, if Angie or who will. Maribel. Because <laughs> Maribel is, I'm saying Maribel because she's still in um, the plant. She's, um, I, I think she's been enduring more, uh, her and Violeta have been enduring a little more, uh, I'm going to say what, um, uh, the anger of the people, because they blame us for everything that's going on, because the company made it seem like um, we made it to, for them to have issues with the company, you know what I mean, like, uh, retaliation, they're the ones that are taking the retaliation, it's not even, uh, from the company, it's more from the same employees towards the employees. So that's why I was calling out on Maribel. 
Yeah, and I see Austin also has his hand up. So Maribel, if you want to share a bit and then I'll let Austin speak after. Maribel, si quieres, um, puedes hablar en español y la gente te escucha. People can switch to the channel. I think Maribel is going to speak in Spanish. Sí, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Maribel. Good afternoon. My name is Maribel Medina. I work with, um, I still work in this company of Allen Brothers, and we decided in December of 2020 that after all the lies that the company made, we were just left with resentment and anger that they only wanted to take their money from us. Uh, a ton of things. It was really difficult, even a couple weeks later, after the strike, working and seeing the folks staring at us behind our backs that were calling us rats, thieves. They wanted us to keep maintaining the work. And not just at me, but everyone who is involved in this. The company made lots of um, repressive moves against us. They persecuted us in, in a way that was impossible to keep working there. I worked a night shift. Now I'm in a day shift, but when I got to work to start my shift, I would just start crying. I didn't want to go inside and start working. The awareness that as I was arriving from my from my shift, the people who were just leaving for their shift and, and going home, who used to smile at me were no longer even looking at me or they would give me these awful looks for having done this. And these are the things that they didn't do before, but I wanted to continue with this, with my face forward, my, my head up that it would be much better to have a union, a syndicate that we could represent ourselves. Because like Lola said, COVID was the, the drop in the glass that overflowed everything. People really took account and noticed that we really needed a change. The companies all have the same way of contracting, of policing, of firing people. Some people work, work at a company for 30 years and they still don't receive these benefits. Like a friend, of, a, a work partner of mine told me last May Yakima Valley woke up. People listened and, and saw that only only fighting together, we would achieve the things that we need. It's really difficult because we're not fighting against a company that doesn't have money. We're fighting against a company that has a ton of money that takes advantage of their influences. And for us, they, shut, they closed all the doors. They ran us off. We didn't do it. for resentment, but because we think we're going in the correct direction. And this is what we want to achieve in, in the Valley of Yakima. Quizás pensaba Wanchi si quieren contar un poquito sobre las cosas que están haciendo ahora, porque yo este fin de semana haciendo trabajo por la comunidad y creo que por ahí es importante si quieren compartir algo de eso. I invited them to share a little bit of the work they're doing right now for the community. Iba a hablar Agustín, ¿o no? Okay. Um, this weekend we had an event. Um, this is, um, what is it? The, um, I believe from vaccines is the second event we have of vaccines. Um, but this one was, I mean, it was fabulous. It was awesome. We had a lot of um, organizations that joined 
And we worked together in such a beautiful way that the community was very uh, thankful and happy that this took place. I, I still hear good remarks over what happened on uh, April 17, which was on Saturday. Uh, everybody was happy, happy to get the vaccines and to see how organized uh, we were. And um, I mean, we gave out $50 gift cards, not us, I mean, another organization gave it out, but we just collaborated. And, um, and it was, I, I thought it was a, a, a beautiful event. Lola came down to uh, participate, which was incredible. Uh, she was so energetic, so helpful. Um, it was, uh, I still can't get over it because it was, I think one of the best events that I've been in so far uh, collaborating. Um, it was beautiful to see the community come together and be thankful for what we were doing out there. Um, for a uh, change we want to, uh, the community to see that we want to do better things, that we want to help them out, that we have their best interest and that we want to make a change out there. Anybody else? <laughs> Augustine? Okay. <laughs> um, and we're raising his hand, ready to speak. Okay, yes, Austin. Uh, tranquilo, habla como... <laughs> okay, este, pues una de las cosas que yo quería decir, este, pues, que es bien importante que nosotros... That it's really important that now as an organization that we are, and for all of the fight that we're doing right now, that's important that we use the support of the community of organizations and all the people who want to support us, especially what we need the most right now is organize our costs. Because right now we still have too many costs de recursos ahorita uh, y para poder seguir este organizando and we do need a lot of funds and resources to in order to continue this organization para poder representar otros trabajadores so that in the future we can have a campaign to present to other workers we're going to be working towards that and we're hoping for collaboration between everyone la comunidad que nos quiera between all the organizations en esto Podemos poner nuestro, All the communities that would like to help us and support us. We have also a website where they can go and check out everything we do. We can put the website eh, no where you have can go to see what we're todavía doing. Bien, este, we have a website where they can go and see what we're Ha registrado, ¿verdad? Pero sí, we vamos still don't have a PayPal eso, set Estamos up. tratando de tener todo en regla, de tener todo organizado para poder este, recibir más ayuda de eso, principalmente monetaria ahorita. Esto que nos But we'll be organizing this so that we can receive more help. Más falta, ¿verdad? Y muchas gracias por... Principally financial support, because um, that's always what's needed, and thank you so much. Sí, se me apagó. Pero ahí está ya. Bueno, muchas gracias. Okay, so now um, I'm going to ask Laurel to share a little bit of what they've been up to. Um, you know, they had the contract uh, before them, and also they were doing some work in the legislature. So I would like her, she can share a little bit of that. Um, so, Right, I think I think there's a lot of work to be done. You know, I think what happened at, at Twin City Foods isn't, you know, and Lola's presentation highlighted this isn't unique in any way, right? The conditions weren't unique, the workers weren't unique. Um, you know, we just like, you know, we won the vote 126 to two because we put enough pressure because we organized people and we put enough pressure on the company, right? And it happened to be a company that was susceptible to that pressure. Um, but I think, you know, I think our work now is really showing that, that the long-term change, that these sorts of long-term changes are possible. 
um, not just at Twin City Foods, but at other, you know, other processing plants um, because the conditions that workers are facing aren't, aren't unique. Um, so, you know, showing that it's possible, um, winning, winning a contract that sets a standard and makes some of those, makes those long-term changes um, uh, sustainable. Um, you know, I think as, as an organizer and, and just a person, there's a part of us that wants to maybe forget the last year. Um, and I think, you know, part of our work is like reminding workers and each other um, that, you know, if the boss didn't care about you during the pandemic, they still, you know, and weren't there for you, they still don't care about you, right? Like you're still, you know, your labor is still uh, disposable. Um, and, you know, which, which we're seeing in the vaccination campaigns, like we have not seen companies, um, you know, at Twin City Foods, we have not seen the company step forward to um, be proactive about making sure that people are vaccinated and have access. Um, and then, you know, and, and part, of, part of it for us is that um, food manufacturers, manufacturing companies in Washington state receive um, millions of dollars in, um, in tax, tax breaks. Um, and, you know, if, if this is money that isn't going to, um, into, you know, schools and, and public services, um, you know, what are, what are we getting, what are we getting in return? Is it creating, you know, is, is that money subsidizing quality jobs? Um, and, you know, so we, we introduced legislation this, this past session that would have required companies to follow labor and employment law um, if they, um, in order to qualify for, um, for tax breaks, um, we're, you know, we're looking at how to reintroduce, reintroduce that legislation most effectively, but really looking at like, what are these companies, um, um, you know, if their workforce is disposable, what do they care about? Um, and that tends to be their bottom line. Um, so those are kind of our, our next steps. Thank you, Laurel. Um, so Angel, um, could you tell us a little about what's happening? And I know you've had some thoughts about, you know, the connection between, you know, settle, resettlement policy for refugees and the type of workplaces they end up. And you know, so maybe you want to share a little bit of, about that. Sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, what the pandemic kind of brought to light, um, particularly around the navigation of benefits and just advocacy, um, for the workers was there is, there seems to be kind of a conflict of interest between the, the um, resettlement agency's ability to support, have the capacity or um, I guess information to support the workers during the pandemic, that was especially true. And it does seem like there's a conflict of interest sometimes for them to advocate in particular, for example, with Tyson, if that's, if that's the um, corporation that you are placing most of your refugees as they're being resettled, how much pushback are you willing to give towards that company when, um, when they aren't necessarily doing what's best for the, um, the worker? And so what we did see was um, around navigation of benefits when we asked particularly those groups that are funded to be part of the resettlement process to actually step up and help the, um, the workers with navigation they gave misinformation um, and, and it was confusing at that time. So I understand that, but Friends of Tyson Workers, we were seeking out counsel. Northwest Justice provided some of that. We sought out and tried to, to do our best to provide some training to some different organizations here locally. But um, we just saw a disconnect between um, the, what we thought, where we were told were the people who were receiving money to be actually doing the work and, and, and their willingness to actually step up and do that work. And so it, it became interesting. And, and I think that's something to follow up on. Um, and I plan to, we plan to pursue that a little bit. Um, in addition, just you know, long-term thinking around what would be of benefit for, um, in the long run would be a basic understanding for refugees as they're being resettled about labor rights. There's a, there isn't, in, in my understanding, much information given to them about how they can advocate for themselves. 
and what, what the law says about um, unfair labor practices, uh, particularly with, you know, younger youth, some of, the, some of the young people that we were working with at that time, I think some curriculum around labor rights would be really helpful for them as they are oftentimes um, look to it within the community as, um, you know, because it, typically their English is a little stronger. And so, so just looking at that um, long-term uh, also, I guess the bigger picture around um, how the funds are allocated and particularly during COVID, there was a lot of money that rolled out um, through the CARES Act. And we just weren't seeing that. There was kind of a disconnect. There was a lot of food boxes given away. <laughs> and I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to that, um, but we specifically had people giving us information saying we, we really could use someone to help us navigate this really complicated system so that we can get paid. We wouldn't necessarily need the food box if we were able to access um, um, the benefits that were in place for us to access. And so that was one of the things that was discouraging in the midst of that. There were some agencies that just seemed like that was their go-to. And, and, and I think part of that could be that they're Again, I don't work for I don't I don't work for any of organization or nonprofit or any anything to do with refugee resettlement. But I do think that sometimes there's a disconnect between um, what the people really need, and particularly in this situation, there was a disconnect about what was really needed within that community. And I'm not sure if there was enough of a connection to get that information across. If that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. And definitely uh, there's a lot of educators here. So like, I really wanna ask to take up on Angel's suggestion of like coming up with some labor curricula for high schoolers um, and for um, refugees and use resettled uh, folks that are just coming into the country. So that's, um, I wanna thank everyone again. And now we're just gonna um, do you have a little bit of time for some questions? I don't wanna take more um, time for my panelists, but if you can hang around for a little bit more and we can um, entertain some of the questions from the audience, we can do that now. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I think there were some questions in the chat. Um, I don't know, Jen, if you've been collecting them because I haven't been able to read. Yes, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, mostly having to do with um, organizing, that makes sense. Um, the first question is, um, there's quite a variety of people who work in these plants, um, particularly Karen and Somali workers, uh, immigrants. Um, and how are you able to organize such a diversity of employees or workers? And was that a challenge or what strategies did you use? And that would be to, uh, I guess, um, Probably Angel can tell us a little bit about this, and sure. I think it was complicated. <laughs> yeah, it, it was uh, it was complicated, and I and I welcome any um, input from. There's a couple other friends here, of, <laughs> participants of Friends of Tyson Workers. So if anybody wants to jump in here, um, because I actually the other couple that are on the call with right now, they were really instrumental in, in getting some of the information out in other languages. Uh, and and. In my experience, most of my friends are part of the Quran and Burmese community. And so that was who I was directly in contact with. Um, and initially we reached out to some different groups. There were some people out of University of Washington that provided some language interpretation for us specifically um, around materials. And I, I think honestly, um, using the term organizing is kind of a loose term. Uh, we were just really trying to keep up with the, what was happening at the, at the time. So we were really just providing, I think it was kind of threefold, the immediate needs of the people as they were come, as they were getting sick. So that looked like practical things like masks and sanitizer at the time we thought were really important. Those kind of things were tangible things. And then the, you know, the second thing that we were working on was um, just, workplace safety, like trying to get the plant stopped just long enough to, you know, to pause to test everyone. And then the third prong was the access to benefits. And so that was challenging when you think about, I, I think there was, my daughter might be able to speak up there. I think there was 14 languages. In addition, of course, there's a lot of Spanish uh, speaking workers at the Tyson plant, but there are additional 14 languages, I think, at that plant in Tabumalula. So 
that presents um, some barriers around reaching everybody with the really important information that needed to get out at the time. That seems to lead into another question um, that um, uh, for, for um, maybe Laurel uh, as an organizer, um, what does the union, UFCW in particular, see as the main strategy for organizing this industry as a whole? Is it more important to put resources into legislative strategy or organizing? And if organizing, what are the particular targets? Is there a strategy of how to go after this industry? Really good question. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wish I wish we had a, you know, a, a strategy to organize the industry as a whole. Um, you know, I think organized labor hasn't hasn't figured that out yet. Um, right. It's really it's about like, um, you know, in these campaign like it's it's a year. Right. It's been a year. It's been a year long process to organize Twin City Foods and we don't yet have a contract. Um, and that's pretty typical, probably fat. It's fast. <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, I, th I think what legislative options can, it's, I don't think we can legislate our way, you know, into better standards. I think that's really, um, you know, that's really difficult or to change the industry. Um, but I do think legislation can provide leverage in organizing. Um, you know, right now companies have, very little to lose when they break the law. I think we saw that, at, you know, probably the, the Allen brother workers would, would agree that, um, you know, if you, you fire people, harass, intimidate, surveil workers, and you get a slap on the wrist, um, right? So what we're, we're interested in, or, you know, workers call L and I over and over and over, like, I can't count the number of people who've slipped and fell and um, you know, on the on the floors at Twin City Foods and called L and I and, you know, if there's a fine, it's not enough to motivate the company to do things differently. Um, so what we're interested in is what are, you know, is there, um, you know, putting there, putting tax breaks at risk. Um, that's some real, like that's some, you know, then companies have skin in the game. Um, that's kind of what we're, what we're interested in is how do we make it, um, you know, how do, how do we change the, the calculus of companies and change the calculus for workers coming forward to say, um, you know, if I come forward, it's not just a slap, my company isn't just going to get a slap on the wrist. Um, it could be, um, you know, there's going to be some real consequences um, because there are real consequences for workers speaking up. Yes. Yeah. I was, Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, Jen. I actually want to invite um, Edgar Franks, who is part of the Familias Unidas por la Justicia, to also answer this question since they've been doing organizing in the Yakima Valley for a long time. Um, so maybe he also, I think he will also have some very in interesting insights about this. Um, was a question about labor and what direction we're going or? Yeah, so like a little bit of like, you know, the organizing strategy and the priorities to try to organize, you know, the industry, I mean, food processors, fruit processors, and like, you know, maybe a little bit of like, you know, the different route that Familias Unidas and Trabajadores Unidos por la Justicia have been going, which is like more an independent route. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely think that there's um, a growing, not only need, but a, like a curiosity by workers about what unions could do for them. Um, I know Trabajadores Unidos has been reached out to by people from other uh, warehouses, not only in the Yakima Valley, but around the state. Um, you know, Familias Unidos is a farm worker organization or a farm worker union, so we don't tend not to get too much with the uh, processing, but we want to really support the work that um, TUJ has been doing by establishing themselves as an independent union. Um, uh, I think from this last year, um, and the, the fight that was in the Yakima Valley, we learned a couple of things. Um, again, that's the hub of um, agriculture in Washington. So it's really hard to break through a lot of the, the culture that exists there, retaliations and uh, intimidation of workers. Um, so the work that TUJ is doing, I think is laying the groundwork for future campaigns uh, to be not only to win union contracts, but establish a culture of being pro-worker instead of pro-industry. 
Um, I think uh, they did a lot in changing the rules of the state by going out on strike and calling attention to processors and the, the bodegas that were there. Um, so, you know, that all came from the protests. Um, and again, uh, you know, as we saw like today with the, the, the trial of Derek Chauvin, you know, the protest work and getting him uh, uh, going to jail. So like the protest that the workers in Yakima Valley, they did um, throughout uh, May and June last year um, really shifted um, a lot of the power away from the industry and gave some back to the workers. But now it's, you know, what do we do with the little power that we have now? Like, how far do we want to take it? And the event that the TUJ had last week with giving out vaccinations really and providing resources and mutual aid to Yakima, um, worker to worker, I think that's, um, you know, that's a direction um, to build, build more um, um, people supporting the union. So, um, you know, hopefully we can shift the industry quickly, um, you know, so uh, I think that's kind of where the thoughts are about, about what happened and about where labor, um, where labor is right now. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, and actually, you know, I'm going to wrap us up pretty soon, but I just wanted to see if any of the workers or the organizers wanted to add something else, you know, as a conclusion and like all your experiences where you are right now, and then there was something else that you wanted to add to give you the opportunity to do so before we uh, finish our meeting. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else. Um, I know some of the workers are around, haven't spoken, so maybe they want to say something. I just want to say thank you, Lola, for your research and for for backing up, um, you know, the workers workers experience with with data that we can bring to, you know, bring to policy maker policymakers and make accessible to other, um, you know, other arenas. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, yeah, Angel's there. I don't know, Angel, you want to add anything else? I just wanted to um, reiterate what Laurel said because that experience was it was um, overwhelming last year. And to have Lola come in and just encapsulate um, and take the time and energy to put that on paper, I just really appreciate all the hard work that you've done, Lola. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thanks again, um, everyone that joined and listened. And thank you, first and foremost, to all the workers and the organizers. You're amazing. You inspire me every day. Um, the fight's not over, so let's keep fighting. Everyone else here, please support our workers, um, the organizers. That's much, that's much needed in, in many different ways. Um, it takes all of us um, to enact change. So let's keep up the fight.